Welcome to Tech It Up with Jessica Lee. Today I have a director of user experience from Guywire Software and she's going to share with us a lot about customer success and what it takes to be successful. Marilyn, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Great it's, to have you here. It's wonderful to be here and I'm very excited about this topic. Oh, uh, We would love to hear more about what does that mean, user experience and your role, your responsibility, your team. Well, for us, um, it all comes down to the definition of user. We are a software company and we have a, a set of, a very diverse set of users. And in our case, we do software for the insurance industry. Mm -hmm. And what that means is we provide software to insurance companies um, for them to run their business. This so is a they, B2B? B2B mm -hmm. kind of business. So they can take, they can do claims, they can write policies, they can collect uh, premiums in their billing mm -hmm. and then we also have a second set of users or which are their customers I see the consumers like us right so uh, when you go on your insurance company's website mm -hmm. and you log in and you can pay your bill or mm -hmm. you know file change something, claim file a claim mm -hmm. that's a second set of cons of users mm -hmm. so we in, in at guidewire deal with those the b2b and their b2c okay so we provide software across that oh, whole oh, ecosystem i see okay. so you are managing a team of 25 right i have about 25 people mm -hmm. um who do design and research around all of that okay. so we do um what we call formative research where we have to learn about those people like just I didn't know when before I started this what a claim adjuster did or what an actuary did or okay. we need to learn about those people and then we design software for them I and see. then we do additional research like usability testing mm -hmm. where we say oh did we design the right thing mm -hmm. for those people okay and then we also have to go out to say small businesses for for companies that want to write insurance for small businesses and find out what's important to them okay so we do that same kind of research and then we do design okay around that mm -hmm. So you have various personas yes. that you have yes. to really identify, and then you're creating that mapping journey. Uh, the, the journey experience. maps, yes. Okay. So what we do is we have um, right now 25 to 30 different personas mm. around That's all those. Lot. Yes, a lot. And we're developing. We have <laughs> oh a project. We're developing another seven right oh. now, and so we can learn about all of these people and develop software that matches what their jobs are and what wow. their. Sometimes it's really oh we're really targeting millennials or. We're, we're targeting, you know, retired people or whatever, okay, okay. so those are different personas. Yeah, and those personas, millennial versus someone who's older, or maybe the communication tools they use Absolutely. are different? Right, someone who's, who's a millennial or younger, they really like to chat. They really like to text, to text. right, exactly. Whereas um, you'll find someone who's a little bit older really wants to pick up a phone and call somebody. Right. Okay. And so we have to deal with both of those and dealing with different devices. Are you on a computer? Are you on a phone? Are you on a tablet? Yeah, yeah. Right, right. So okay. we have to deal with all of that. And we have people who do what's called interaction design. Mm. So that's where I'm saying, okay, what buttons do I push? What's the flow like? And then we have visual designers that make that look prettier. Mm. And then we have researchers. Okay. So the research part, you're, you're talking about sitting down as they're using it and watching them, how they do it. Sometimes. And getting questions, the one-on-one -on -one conversations. Right. That's the, the um, we do some of that in the formative stage where we sit down and we do site visits. We'll actually go sit with someone who's taking claims over the phone mm -hmm. and listen in on their calls and find out how they do their job and what's important to them and what's not important and mm -hmm. how they're measured. and. Mm -hmm. So that's like on site with them. It's called contextual inquiry. Okay. And then we also then we go design things, and then we have maybe those same people come in and try new stuff. Right. And tell us, give us feedback on how that new stuff's working. Mm. And so some of the challenges you might experience would be like just having so many persona and so many projects, and also the different experts that you need to collaborate right. with. Right. So. There's, there's a lot of challenges. That's definitely one because if you think about all those different parts of running the business mm -hmm. and all the different ways that customers interact with those businesses, there are always dozens of projects going on. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we need a large team to deal with all of those different projects that are all in different stages right. of the software development process. Mm -hmm. The agile, the speed yes. of development is very fast now. Right, right. And in fact, 
to do to do these projects right, you have to do that research up front. Mm -hmm. Then you have to spend time doing design, which is not it's a creative process and you don't just rush a creative mm -hmm. process. And then you do the research to make sure that you've done the right thing, sort of the before and after. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's no time to do all that mm -hmm. with all these different projects. So we have to kind of be very efficient about about and uh, pick our battles, figuring mm -hmm. out what are the right things to do to get this next step out the door. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a big challenge, and the so the pace of software development is very fast. And I think that there's always that uh, challenge of how much do you automate, how much AI do you inject, and how much of that personal touch, uh, the human touch. In our in our work, we don't have a lot of AI in terms of the design process, um, and we try and inject that where we can in terms of the user experience, mm. like with something like a chatbot. Chatbot, right? So yes. that's. That means that the the insurance carrier needs one less person to answer questions. Right, especially for when it's very repetitive. Mm -hmm. I forgot my password. Uh, right, exactly. <laughs> How much do I owe? When is my next payment due? Yes. You know, what's my deductible? Those are questions that a chatbot can yes, answer. Yes, yes. I think that's that's a good part of automation is, mm -hmm. is when to use that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so you are also enabling all the chat right there in the software itself. Yes. All right. Yes. So what we do is figure out what are the right ways. To um, to answer those kinds of questions, how friendly do you want to get? How transparent do you want to get? Is this a, is this a machine or not a machine? That kind of thing. Mm. So we do studies on that and put people in front of, of chatbots and um, and also just our software. Is do you want it to be friendly and welcoming? Do you want it to just be efficient and business like? And that's different for different personas. For the persona. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you actually have been with the company for over seven years. About seven and a half years. Yes, yes. it has grown a lot. It has grown a lot. I went from being the only user experience person there to this team of 25, and we're actually worldwide now. Uh -huh. So I've got teams in, um, in our home base in California, and then I've got people around the United States. I've got a team in Dublin, Ireland, mm -hmm. and a team in Krakow, Poland. Okay. And so we have unique challenges there. <laughs> dealing with the whole offshore thing. Uh, it's very hard to really collaborate when you're eight hours away or yes. nine hours away, which is what those teams are. Yeah. And so we have to make an extra effort to be one team. Right, right. So Somebody's got to work in the evening. Well, I have meetings that generally start at 6.30 or 7 or 7.30 in the morning, <laughs> and the team there, it's not unusual for them to be in meetings as late as 8 o'clock or so at night. Yeah, I, I understand, because we have teams in uh, Poland, and we have teams in India. Oh, India is so, so, even worse. Yes, so we do have to... Um, Somebody has to sacrifice the evening hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a tough one. But we try and balance it a little. Like I don't schedule meetings late on their Fridays, mm -hmm. and nor do we schedule meetings early on my Mondays. Right. <laughs> that helps a little bit. <laughs> what about uh, some of the innovations that are coming down the line with uh, 2019? And uh, you know, technology is moving fast. So. And and it's to our benefit because. Mm -hmm. As creative people, and my team is really full of creative people, we can imagine uh, interactions, designs on the screen that were not implementable 10, 20 years ago. Like what? Um, just different motion animations. We call them micro animations. Mm -hmm. Little things like you know, as you're typing into into a screen, you know the into, like your password. How that little thing animates it says if it's strong or not strong. Yes, that's a micro animation. I see. And it really helps the experience. And it, yeah. you, it wasn't that long ago that that just wasn't technically possible to do in real time. Hmm. And now it is. So there's small, there's small and large innovations that allow that. Or like changing the entire color scheme of our product um, with just a few clicks. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty interesting for us because remember we're selling software into insurance companies and they want to brand it. Mm -hmm. They want to do their own branding. So we need to... So you white label your product? Pretty much. Okay. And then they can put their own colors and their own logos and right, things right. like that on it. But we have to design the experience for them to be able to do that. Um, I noticed people are using emojis, like mm -hmm. smiling face or happy mm -hmm. or frowning face mm -hmm. uh, as a visual way of mm -hmm. maybe rating things. And sometimes that's appropriate. It really depends on... That would be appropriate, say, in a customer environment where the the consumers Consumer. there right yeah. whereas you're probably not going to ask your your claims adjusters to be rating things with emojis yeah it's yeah. more business-like versus consumer right right and we have to think of those personas and what about voice command you know with the um, Alexa the Google home all well, these voice command uh, how are you 
putting that into your development? That tends to come into play more in the chatbots that we were talking about mm -hmm. because that's what you're doing. You're saying, you know, Alexa, you know, ask such and such insurance company mm. uh, for a quote or get me get me a quote on insurance mm. and then insurance companies have to hook into that mm -hmm. and, um, and you're enabling all that now? Um, that's more of a technology enablement than a user experience enablement it's more of the Alexa user experience mm. to hook into these these insurance company backends. I see, I so, see, okay yeah. well I want to ask you about women in tech so you've been yes. there for seven years. I have been. How has the journey been? You've I've been, been in tech a lot longer than seven years. At the company. Uh, and then, you know, there's a lot yes. of conversations around diversity right. and inclusion and companies are putting in programs to address that. And how has that been for you? Here? It's really interesting because first of all, it's changed over the years because the conversations are easier to have now. Um, people are More open comfortable to, to, talk to talk about it. Okay. The problem point. is when you actually want them to do something, because um, there, there is definitely this. Oh yes, we of course we want more women in in the senior management levels. But there, but the folks there are completely at a loss for the most part about how to do that. Mm -hmm. You see it at selected companies where they're successful, and it's because they make a concerted effort, mm -hmm. not to give preference, but to change the norm. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is, the the normal way we recruit, for example, is to do very matter of fact job descriptions, put them out on the standard channels, and wait for someone to apply. Mm -hmm. That doesn't translate as well to women and some minorities. Sometimes you have to word things different. There are services right now mm -hmm. that you can run your job postings through that te that suggest wording changes to make them more accessible or more more um, uh, enticing to to women, for example. Yes. Um, there are, and then you have to post them in places that are maybe non-standard. You know, there are conferences for there's Black Engineers Conference, there's Society of Women Engineers, there's different women places that you would that, target. Yeah, that's the girls who code. Girls who code. Right? Do you know putting money into that? Right. But it's not just about the number of women versus men in, in leadership, but that's also a, a pay inequality. Mm -hmm. uh, this morning with Oracle government finding that yes, they pay yes women and minorities 25% less than they pay white men, for example. Um, so I'm wondering if there's something that can help address that. Well, some of it is just transparency around around pay. In some companies I've seen, there's, there's this secrecy around what the pay ranges are. Mm -hmm. So somebody, any any person really has no way of knowing where they are in the range because mm -hmm. there's just this secrecy around it. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I joined Guidewire, this is uh, something I really liked when we were negotiating pay. One of the things that I was told was, well, the way we, we do pay is if suddenly everyone knew what everyone else made, uh, nobody would be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And I'd love that because <laughs> that's like saying it's equitable and we can justify what we're doing. I always thought that was a good mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, there are study, study after study show that, especially for women, women tend not to, and again, this is a stereotype, ask for more money or ask for promotion. It tends to, it's just a different no, culture. Assertive, yeah. Right, not, and, and even assertive women mm -hmm. tend to not ask as much. Mm -hmm. And so they lag further and further behind. It's like a manager could say, oh, well, they're satisfied with that. Why should I pay them more? And that just over time, that gap gets bigger and bigger. Yeah. yeah. And the, the whole approach to how we um, do grand promotions, how we give more money, needs to be seen holistically, not just the way we've always done it, which is typically the male way we've always done it. Right, right. So in or your, the white way we've always done it. <laughs> in your own organization, within your control, is it a 50-50 situation? In terms of the, the staffing? Mm -hmm. I actually have, um, have it a little easier than most because um, creative type people tend to be more, um, gen there tends to be more gender equity. Mm -hmm. So my team is I'd have to look it up, but I think I'm about 60% women, and I have um, all kinds of different cultures, uh, mm -hmm. African American and Asian and Indian and all kinds. Um, and again, that I, I have it a little easier because of the creative pool okay. that I'm pulling from. Okay. Well, I um, applaud you for that, so that's great to hear. You can only take some of the <laughs> 
But the company is doing well, right? With the digital transformation in the whole industry, everyone is doing digital transformation. Yes, we are in the middle of a very large transformation moving to the cloud. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one of our big corporate goals in the next year, mm -hmm. one to five years is taking software that we used to do on-prem, it's called, where uh, companies would license the software, bring it into their data centers and, and own it and manage it, right. to us owning and managing it, and companies, um, yeah, and companies using it in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a big challenge for us. But the company's being incredibly successful. Yeah, yeah. Does that mean you have to like build it from scratch again for the cloud, or, or just adapt it? Or just some cases okay. build, some cases adapt, um, okay. and we're in the process of that transformation right now. We're really excited about it. And from for my perspective, from user experience perspective, there's a whole class of users that are different now because instead of programmers making the changes when they have in in-house uh, software there are the next level up of business users who will do the the configurations and customizations of the software so it's we're changing who we're targeting our software to very interesting yeah it's fascinating I see. so the way you build it it's almost like instead of coding from the very beginning of uh, command lines you now mm -hmm. allow people to pick blocks to exactly. code. Exactly, that's exactly simpler, right, yes. Yeah, simplify way mm -hmm. of coding. And okay. so you don't have to be a programmer in yeah. order to, like what I mentioned before about changing the color scheme and the logos, you don't have to be a programmer to do that anymore. Right. Yeah, just drag and drop. Right, exactly, yes. exactly. So it's a whole different class of users. I can use it then. <laughs> yes, you totally could. You totally could. Totally yes. 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 Oh. So Marilyn, uh, talk to me a little bit more about the types of expertise that, that you have that's needed to do the job. Well, it's actually really um, varied and the people in my team come from a huge number of different backgrounds. When it comes to researchers, there you need a lot of just research statistics, things like that, but also ethnography, how you actually get information about people. Um, so they need a pretty varied background and also there's a whole bunch of tools around that and analysis tools and study tools so that's a whole separate area. Mm -hmm. Then when you talk about designers there's there now are quite a number of like school programs for what's called HCI, okay. Human Computer Interaction, you can get a degree in that, wow. bachelor's, master's, PhDs mm -hmm. um, and so there's training in that but there are a lot of people who come to it not through that they they're industrial designers or architects my background is not in I didn't have a degree like that I have a bachelor's and a master's in computer science mm. and I but I was doing these end user applications so I was really in touch with users yeah. and then I started getting more and more involved and self-trained on how to do the the science of user experience and then you have the really creative types who are very visual who are very into the flows and and the attitudes and things like that. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a variety of people. When I look at the people in my team, some are technologists, some are artists, some are, like I said, they come from architecture, all different areas. Oh, wow, that's great. Yeah. And they, they all have different personality because mm -hmm. of the more artistic type versus more um, technical mm -hmm. uh, engineering mindset. Mm -hmm. So depending on what we're designing, we might call in different people based on that expertise. If we're designing something that has to be a really beautiful screen, mm -hmm. I'll call in one of my visual people because that's not my strength. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's a very intricate interaction, we call that interaction design, um, I'm really good at that. And so I would be someone who could, who could work through that flow. Okay. So how do you manage a team that's so diverse and so global too? And so artistic. I mean, managing artistic types <laughs> by itself is, is pretty interesting. Um, but we really have to look for opportunities to collaborate. Uh -huh. So part of my job, I feel like I'm the traffic cop all the time. I'll talk to someone on the team who's working on a project, then I'll talk to someone else who's working on a whole different project, but those are similar. I see similar patterns and I hook them up and they, they help each other. So that's a lot of what I do is making sure the right people are talking. Facilitating. Yeah, a lot of facilitation. Okay. And I think any good team leader, any good manager yeah. has that role. Mm -hmm. But especially where we have so many different projects that seem so diverse, when it comes to the basic designs, um, I can see commonalities and bring them together. Also, we have all these different products and we have to really pay attention to consistency. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a team off here doing the work on the claim system and another team working on the policy system, mm -hmm. there's a lot of cross-pollination in terms of the work at the, at the insurance carrier. And so we want those experiences to be consistent. 
So you don't have to learn this whole new language or right. tool or interface when you go from one of these tools to another. So those, the designers working on those two areas have to be talking to each other okay. and have to be using common design principles so that we have consistency across of our, all of our products. And that's another major initiative we're doing along with the cloud initiative, okay. is getting consistency across our whole design language. How does your group fit into the whole big picture of your organization? Do you report to uh, the technology leader, a CTO? Or how, how that's, that's a very interesting question because we're going through an organizational transformation. Okay. At the same time, we've got some new leadership. Okay. And so we're examining that literally right now. I have a meeting about that later okay. on. Um, well, what has it been then? Well, typically, we in different companies, it's different. But generally, we bounce around between reporting into the development organization, reporting into product management who are usually the people who decide what we're building and mm -hmm. what we're releasing. Sometimes we're, we're in a, a whole separate customer experience group, sometimes in marketing. Mm -hmm. So it's very, um, there are different schools of thought around that. And um, right now we have a product organization mm -hmm. that has uh, development, the, the actual programmers, and uh, product management, and we're in, we're in that organization. Okay. Wow. It's it's widely diverse at different companies. Well, thank you so much, Marilyn, thank for coming you. in and sharing with us the user experience. We would love to have you come back and talk more about it as you go through this transformation to the cloud and the, the change in the organization itself. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Take it up with Jessica Lee, Marilyn Hollinger, Director of User Experience at Guy Wire Software. Thank you.